the hearing at the nation's highest court, a historic hearing for some very big questions about the Constitution, the future of our democracy, and at the heart of the case, a request from voters for some accountability for an unprecedented insurrection. First up, in today's hearing, Jonathan Mitchell, an attorney for Donald Trump, he argued, among other things, that January 6th was not an insurrection, that it was a riot. He also argued that the president is not technically an officer of the United States. Here's what Justice Sonia Sotomayor had to say about that. The principal argument is that the president is not an officer of the United States, correct? Yeah, I would say it a little more forcefully than what Your Honor just described. We believe the presidency is excluded from office under the United States, but the argument we have that he's excluded the president as an officer of the United States is the stronger of the two textually and has fewer uh, implications for other constitutions. A bit of a gerrymandered rule, isn't it, designed to benefit only your client? I certainly wouldn't call it gerrymander. That implies nefarious intent. Well, the, you didn't make it up. I know some scholars have been discussing it. But just so we're clear, under that reading, only, um, only the petitioner is disqualified because virtually every other president except Washington um, mm -hmm. has taken an oath of, to support the Constitution, correct? That's right. Then, the attorney for the Colorado voters, Jason Murray, came under intense questioning. Even some of the liberal justices expressed skepticism about his arguments. A big focus for the court, why one state would have the power to disqualify a candidate for federal office. I mean, the whole point of the 14th Amendment was to restrict state power, right? States uh, shall not abridge privileges immunity. That seems to be a position that is at uh, at war with the whole thrust of the 14th Amendment and very ahistorical. I think that the question that you have to confront is why a single state should decide who gets to be president of the United States. In other words, you know, this question of whether a former president is disqualified for insurrection uh, to be president again is, you know, just say it, it sounds awfully national to me. Chief Justice John Roberts expressed fear that disqualifying Trump would open a Pandora's box of reprisals from Republicans, that the act of disqualifying Trump from running for office would break democracy. If Colorado's uh, position is upheld, surely there will be disqualification proceedings on the other side, and some of those will succeed. Some of them will have different standards of proof. Some of them will have uh, uh, different rules about uh, evidence. Maybe the Senate report won't be accepted in others because it's hearsay. Uh, maybe it's beyond a reasonable doubt, whatever. In very quick order, I would expect, um, although my predictions have never been correct, uh, I would expect that uh, you know, a goodly number of states will say, uh, whoever the Democratic candidate is, you're off the ballot, and others uh, the, for the Republican candidate, you're off the ballot, and it'll come down to just a handful of states that are going to decide the presidential election. That's a pretty daunting consequence. There is a lot to get to today, and this is where we start with former acting U.S. Solicitor General Neil Katyal, plus former Deputy Assistant Attorney General and former U.S. Attorney Harry Littman, who was there today at the arguments for us and with me at the table for the entire hour, former top prosecutor at the Department of Justice, Andrew Weissman. Neil, I want to go really broad, and then I want to zoom in on some of these individual arguments that we heard. So big picture, what did you make of today's arguments? Did the justices converge on a position in this case? Uh, they did. It did not go well at all for the challengers to Donald Trump, and that's to put it mildly. Um, I've seen hundreds of oral arguments at the Supreme Court. Uh, you often can't tell where the justices are leaning. This one you could, and for good reason. I mean, when you're doing a Supreme Court argument, your job's not only to answer the justices' questions, but to state the affirmative case for why you should win. These lawyers never did that. They made this case sound technical and like a gotcha in the Constitution instead of, you know, basic, making the basic point. But this is the center, a centerpiece of our Constitution forged after the Civil War, after all that bloodshed, for a simple reason, our founders coming together and saying, no more insurrectionists. It's too dangerous to have people who give aid and comfort to the enemy. And there was just such a little discussion of that. And instead, it was all on the other side, like the interchanges, Alicia, you were showing about yep. 50 states. And, you know, we should only let one state shouldn't be able to decide the whole. There were 
five great answers to that. They're all in the front of the court briefs, but we heard none of it. And so um, it was a really dismal showing, unfortunately, for the challengers to Donald Trump. I want you to know if you agree, Andrew, what surprised you most. And, and if you do agree with me, like, is that a prep issue? Is that a strategic issue? How, why does that play out that way? So I have a different take. Sure. Um, uh, I, I, I generally agree with Neil that this maybe wasn't presented in the best possible light. So I do agree with that. I also agree with Neil that this is not one where you sit there and go, like, you don't really can't really tell from the argument. Yeah. The only open issue is whether there will be any justice, any one justice who will actually um, vote to affirm Colorado. I actually don't think there will be, although that's sort of irrelevant what my opinion is, but also, you know, there would need to be five. That's not happening, just to be clear. Um, I, I do think that there are a lot of issues here. Um, and I thought one of the things that is really good for our country, not just for the Supreme Court as an institution, is um, seeing um, the lawyer for Donald Trump did an excellent job, and he conceded things that he should have conceded. He didn't fight things and make outlandish arguments. He didn't, for instance, say, in the, as the Trump lawyer said in D.C., mm -hmm. yeah, I think it's actually okay to kill people, and unless you're impeached and successfully, you can get away with it. I mean, he didn't make those kinds of arguments. He had credibility with the court. He conceded that what happened on January 6th was a riot. He wasn't he, willing to call it an insurrection. He, probably to the shock of his clients, said it was shameful. Um, so I'm not sure Donald Trump would say that. And it, criminal. You know, exactly. He indeed also conceded that um, a federal charge of insurrection would solve a lot of these issues um, that were being raised about needing a national statement in an area to your clip about uh, Justice Kagan saying mm -hmm. this seems very national. Um, it came up, well, what if there was a federal charge under insurrection where the remedy in the congressional statute is that the person who's convicted cannot um, serve? Um, and he conceded, he said, look, whether we may have presidential immunity claims, but that charge and conviction would solve a lot of these national concerns, the concerns about can each and every state create this sort of crazy quilt uh, that, that you heard so many of the justices respond to. Now, Neil, just to be fair, Neil's right that there are responses to this, but it just means that this was one where there were responses on both sides, and Neil's correct to point out that that those weren't necessarily all put forth in the oral argument. You would have to have read the, the briefs for a sort of more detailed, thorough response. Harry, I want to play something that Justice Katanji Brown-Jackson said today about the text of Article 3 of the 14th Amendment. Take a listen. People that were barred, and president is not there. And so I guess that just makes me worry that maybe they weren't focusing on the president and, for example, the fact that electors of vice president and president are there suggests that really what they thought was, if we're worried about the charismatic person, we're going to bar insurrectionist electors, and therefore that person is never going to rise. This came up in the debates in Congress over Section 3, where uh, Reverdy Johnson said, why haven't you included pre president and vice president in the language? And Senator Morrill responds, we have. Look at the language, any office under the United States. Yes, but doesn't that at least suggest ambiguity? And this sort of ties into Justice Kavanaugh's point. In other words, we had a, a person right there at the time saying what I'm saying. The, the language here doesn't seem to include president. Why is that? And so if there's an ambiguity, why would we construe it to, as Justice Kavanaugh pointed out, uh, against democracy? Well, Reverdy Johnson came back and agreed with that reading. Any office is clear. The Constitution says about 20 times. I wonder what you made of Justice Brown Jackson parsing the words of the 14th Amendment. So a few things. Uh, first, just a gloss on what uh, Andrew and Neil Please. are saying. This case was lost before oral argument. It was evident by 1001 uh, which way it was going to go. And while they did uh, 
uh, coalesce around a bottom line. They have not coalesced around a result. And the sort of dramatic aspect of the three hours was that different justices were trying out different things. This one by Katanji Brown Jackson is actually a good example of what Andrew was talking about in terms of concessions. She gave him a softball and he said, no, thank you. Uh, but what she what sh uh, she was offering up is a reason why they would have excluded the president, namely because they were worried about Confederates sort of burrowing into small state offices, not the bigger one. But he um, presciently, I think, said, you know, the overall record is not so good for me on that. That's not my uh, argument. And it was just part and parcel of a very interesting process where everyone seemed to agree with Kagan's point, bedlam and chaos ensues if we affirm, and yet, how exactly are we going to reverse, and it'll be Chief Justice Roberts' job to try to get the, I, I tend to agree with Andrew, nine, but it could be eight uh, justices to endorse a single position, because it's the sort of monumental case where you want the Supreme Court, if you can, to speak with one voice, not just with result, but also rationale.